Dobar dan svima, odnosno, kako bi rekao, na bilingvinalnom good evening, good evening, good morning, good day to everybody, with our co-speakers in LIT, the new episode, we have Luka, Stanja, and I hope we will have Andreas, who is here, and he will be back. Oh, he is here, yeah, he is here. Hello, Andreas. Nice to see you. Hello everybody, so now we can uh, have a different way of talking uh, to remind to all our viewers who were at that plus uh, in domestically in Croatia and internationally uh, we were talking about the subject which are actually challenging us in these uh, new days of new normal and today we will talk about education and everything what was the experience of education with our kids who are now some of us we have experience as a parent, some of us have experience as those who were uh, connecting with education. And I think that Sanya is the best who will be the one who will try to help us today to go through this educational part. So Sanya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. I will do my best. <laughs> so after the uh, lit kickoff session last month, we uh, continue with the second lit uh, topic, which is the topic that requires most responsibility and most dedication, if you ask me, and that is education. Me speaking as an educator, of course. So first I must express gratitude towards every single committed educator that has crossed either my path or the path of my kids, because I know their impact is uh, game changing and it makes a total huge difference. Um, so last night I asked my boys, uh, nine and 10 years old, actually 10 and 11 years old, gosh, they grow fast. Uh, I asked them what they thought I should talk about first when it comes to education. And one of them said, stop bullying and cyberbullying, and the other one said, um, no homework. And I thought to myself, if our educational systems weren't as competitive, based on grades and the GPA, and if kids collaborated and worked together in schools and uh, uh, worked as teams more, there would be no cyberbullying or bullying, uh, as they would belong to a team. They would constantly be forming teams of little experts who rely on one another and work in harmony that is cohesive and at the same time vivacious and intensive and innovative where new ideas are born. So second, when I think of my other son saying no homework, it makes me think of so many schools that adopt zero homework policy. Um, and it makes me think of unpredictability of homework that my boys bring home. And on some days, the same boy has 20 minutes of homework. And on some other days, he has two hours of homework. And, and I'm thinking, how on earth can we plan for sports activities, extracurricular activities, playing instruments, um, uh, family time with such an unpredictability? Anyhow, so daily I'm asking him what questions does he need to answer? So he's showing me workbooks, worksheets, um, notebooks uh, that he needs to have completed by the next lesson. And he's not interested in those questions. He's not finding them motivating or interesting. These are not questions that spark curiosity. So I wonder how I can make him ask his own questions. And that's the secret of inquiry-based learning of having questions drive teaching and learning, whatever type of questions we're talking about, factual, conceptual, debatable, you name it, doesn't matter which questions. So I've seen in my experience working as an educator, especially as an instructional coach, I've seen master teachers come to class seeming as if they are unprepared. So it's the first lesson, okay? First class of the first lesson. And there's nothing open on their desks. They've put nothing on their students' desks. And there's a white, blank whiteboard with nothing on it behind them. And then they start. They start with a single, simple question. That's a provocation, a hook, no matter how we call it. And then they start asking more questions, which spark more questions now coming from other students and this ends up in an inquiry loop and you see a class full of hopeful little heads nodding and with their why with their e with their ears and eyes wide open ready for 
magic and imagination to happen. These educators don't start their lessons with a what to teach. They started their lessons with a why teach it. Then they navigated how they want to teach it. Then they crafted, created and designed the learning experiences that will lead to teaching and learning. And finally, they got into what to teach, which is that piece of content. So let me give you an example. For example, if we want our kids to learn fractions, either because we think they need to or because uh, state curriculum demands it, we will not begin by saying, OK, today we're learning fractions. We will start with a question, something like, if you had two ice creams on a stick and you needed to split it between three siblings, what would you do? Or how would you do it? Or do you know anyone else who would know what to do with it? What would your siblings do? Anything that would spark curiosity and bring up an authentic experience. So we can add more examples to this, or we can further elaborate on this. I wonder how does this resonate with you? Robert, uh, you have a boy also, similar age as my boys. What's your take on questions driving teaching and learning? Um, what questions would you like your son to have? Any thoughts? Robert. We can hear you. Well, today, uh, I, I, you can hear me, I hope, now. Uh, today, I will have a, it's an interesting day when we have a little uh, conversation about the education topic because today is a parental assembly with the uh, teacher in school. I, I don't know if you say it like that, Razadni Sat, I don't know. You can help me with translation. And uh, the, the, the reason why we are going there, why part of the parents uh, initiated this uh, parental gathering with the teacher is mathematics test where they were given in a way you were talking about fraction and everything they were given a test which was uh, um, made and uh, pursued as uh, nothing changed in their life nothing like business was usual they had to have um, the fraction section they had to learn it they had to knew it and then they will have a very heavy test but the fact is what my son has told me is that my parents are not very good in fractions i'm not i'm not mathematics is not very special to me uh, and we were giving the way the the, the methodic of uh, teaching the fractions uh, in this class was that in the e um, school they were given the assignments they had to rewrite it with no explanation and they supposedly they had to learn about the this section in mathematics uh, five, uh, fifth grade by rewriting it which is not possible i already learned and my son said we didn't learn it and we had to fulfill the test as we had a normal class the other thing which i don't understand i truly don't understand i know that part of croatia they are not digitally evolved as a uh, some other parts of Croatia, but those who are like Zagreb, like uh, Svetanedelje is the town where my son goes to the school, or Pula, where my second son, he's now graduated, he's uh, full of age, but he's going to the fourth grade. Uh, why they are not using, if it is possible now, technology, the Zoom technology and uh, uh, Meets uh, from Microsoft or, I don't know, Google Talk, uh, whatever, whichever platform you want to use, why they don't the teacher they don't use it and you can still have the normal class as it was before just it asks that you have to go with computer and that your class should be on the computer i really don't understand there where you have technical ability and that is that you because the school for example the school of uh, uh my younger son they were given all of them. I don't know if it was the part of the government donation, it was a donation of Microsoft, I'm not sure. But they were given the Microsoft school tablet, each one of them, and they don't use it. I mean, why did you give them the tablet if they are not using them for the classes? 
nothing just to check the mail just to check the assignment and that's it and i was like because he was looking i, I like this technical stuff and i was like whoa it, it, i was like more excited about this stuff because it looks microsoft design i like the design of microsoft they are now starting also to make good uh, tablets and everything like uh, before apple apple did it only because before you didn't have that kind of design now you have also that kind of design in microsoft stuff and i was like wow it looks nice and you can do this you can do that and he was like, well, my son was like saying, oh, yeah, you can do that. But then he asked me, why don't we use that? So my question is, if you have a digital era, if you have a digital, uh, unfortunately, reason why to use it, because we didn't use it because we have it. We, we started to use digital uh, possibilities in school education because of the COVID. Why don't we use it? The answer is that not many teachers, as far as I understood, feel comfortable in the using digital tools and i can understand that because you have teachers who are near to the pension and of course that the technology at their time was not the same as it was today but then the school every school has the teacher of informatics even my son ha now has an informatics. why it wouldn't be you know in a way how then say um, uh, friendly uh, to be a teacher who will help to the older teachers how to use zoom to teach them uh, to be at the class if something happens badly because when we have i know what is with their with their problem we had a technical problem before this uh, show started and then we checked out the uh, the tone the audio the video and if that happens to a teacher who is a little bit of higher age i know that it's stressful for him and i know it, it uh, puts him in a position that he get nervous uh, uh, only because of technical stuff because of the wi-fi and everything and the other thing is that probably in the fifth grade those uh, students are more adaptable and knowledgeable of, about techniques than he is. so it's a little bit of authority change but i i think that that's that's one of the things which i uh, when i'm talking about covid and what happened with them we if we if we have to we have a situation that again some of the schools will go again online but if we have to do that i think that we should do physical distance but not social distance and i i don't know why even though we are not using we are not using digital tools in school education not to be uh, social distance. We are not using it. It's hard to keep up with tech savviness, Robert, with teachers, as you said. Um, even if we didn't have those class of informatics, uh, there are, again, isolated classes where teachers teach students about technology. Even if we did have tech integrated teaching and learning, still that would be to a great extent obsolete because we, we, we might uh, switch from handwriting, which is again, not so much um, today's skill into typing and teachers then would uh, want to teach typing skills, which is again obsolete because as we know, we have voice recognition apps. We can just speak into a Google document and it will type our output to a 90% correctness. So it's really hard. I, I, I really empathize with teachers as it's super hard to keep up with the tech sadness and the technology. Um, um, but I agree with you, like those experiences are being irrelevant as they are not being uh, I'm relatable. Sure. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm, I, I can emphasize, as you say, but let me be again the devil's advocate. I emphasize firstly with the medical workers. You know, to be in a COVID department of a hospital for months, for days, for 24 hours, seeing people dying in your hands, I think that is hell of a stress. To be a teacher working from your home, working in your, I know it's stressful also in a different way. It's stressful also for the parents because now we are all in the home. We have to do my job and then help to our kids uh, with the school. It is stressful. But it's not stressful as being a nurse in the COVID department of the hospital. So, so I think that we are we are exaggerating about this stress which is given us in some days. Because I can emphasize with the teacher, it is much more to do. It's much more different. It is a stress. But when you have a problem, remember your uh, co-citizens who is uh, unlucky to be a teacher, but he's a medical brother or medical sister, nurse, doctor in a COVID department. That's stressful. 
And Robert, <clears throat> um, you were mentioning technology and you reminded me of one good story of how computers are made. So how those big companies who build processors and computers work. So um, first of all, I think schooling system, education system is built by society. And somebody years ago made this system up and we never, we didn't change it for a long time. And, uh, and learning remotely is not a new thing. It's much older than learning in a classroom. Um, and uh, so it's made by a society. And what we have now is a schooling system where you learn from recipes. You have something that is very efficient and you just repeat it and you don't understand it. And the difference is, for example, if you have a recipe, um, if you make bread, you know that you have to mix flour, water, you know, eggs, add yeast and let it grow. And then you put it in a pan and, and, and you bake it. And you follow a recipe, you get the bread. You get really good bread. But if somebody, want, if you want to understand it, you need to, biology, chemistry, understanding the, the, the wheat grinder, the supply chain, like all of these things. So uh, understanding cooking makes you understand how to bake bread, but also how to make a sandwich, omelet, uh, you know, uh, vegan meals, vegetarian meals, chicken, whatever. So if you want to be an expert in education, you got to understand how it, how it works. And um, for example, in building computers, what I mentioned is it's a common practice that, uh, for example, you build a computer, if you want to build it 10% faster, you just add a new piece. You just make add a new piece or extend it, make it bigger. And, uh, but until one point when the computer is too big and fundamentally you cannot make it faster. So at some point uh, you need to rewrite it. And those big companies like Intel, AMD, they just rewrite everything. They start everything all over again, every let's say 10 years. And uh, we never did it in education. We have a good recipe that we followed for a long, long time, but the world changes and uh, things change, uh, variables change. We have a lot of technology that we can use now, but nobody thought, I mean, not nobody, but uh, the things should change and should involve those new variables. And we should rewrite what the education system should be. And uh, a good example also are companies, like companies that succeed do this all the time. Uh, for example, what Steve Jobs did with, uh, with Apple, you, he always said, you know, you have diminishing returns in a company. You have uh, iPhone, five and then you know the sales grow but at one point they stagnate so you have to innovate again and you you always uh, you need to continue doing this so you either have short-term uh disaster because you need to innovate something new you spend a lot of money you don't know if it's it's a big risk or you have long-term disaster where your company stagnates and you go bankrupt and it's and we don't think about it in education so we are now we, we had something that was working it's not working anymore so we just need to think of what, what's next. What should we do now? How should we rewrite it? <laughs> <laughs> I see that I have two antagonists here as an educator. <laughs> it's a hard job on me. Thank God Andrea still hasn't said anything. <laughs> uh, this is what, what, what the, I it, be, it could be the third antagonist. But I, I don't <laughs> say, you know, I'm scared. But, but, but listen, uh, I'm not the, the one uh, who is an uh, antagonist uh, towards the educational professional, the pedagogist, uh, the teachers and everything. I really do admire what they are doing. Because you have to remember the half of our uh, day, they are the ones who are taking responsibility of educating our kids. And I do respect how important their work is, and I admire what they, what they are doing, especially in the environment, If you, I don't know how it is in Malta, in uh, Western Europe, where the authority has uh, di been diminished uh, of, the, of the professors in the schools, because in Croatia you have so many, uh, I don't know how to say, visual parents who want to have that their Parent, uh, their kids are having all A's and they are making great pressure on the uh, professors and it, it is a thing where even the kids they are seeing that if they get a, a B or F they will uh, uh, just tell to the parents that it is unjust and then the parent will come and they will fight with them and everything will be better so in a way uh, I think that the pressure to the teachers nowadays without COVID is a uh, great one and that uh, uh, we uh, lost the one thing if we are, remember the analog time of our being and that is pre-digital time of education which I miss and which I like 
For me, my teacher was a God, all-knowing God. It's not always to be uh, that one person is all-knowing because there is not. But from the perspective of the child, you had some kind of discipline. You had some kind of authority and some kind of uh, obligation which were given to you. Because when I had for my kids, it's possible that they don't finish their homework. Because, you know, I will get minus. It's okay. For me, it is impossible that I don't do my homework first. And that comes from the authority of the teachers, which in a way has um, disappeared in this new digital era. So I, I'm not antagonist against the teachers. No, I'm not just joking. I didn't think you were. I'm just saying that uh, there are um, there are uh, attitudes between the three of us that are seemingly opposing and contradictory, while they are actually not. Um, uh, when, when Luca, you mentioned that the, our curriculum and education is not being um, redefined as rewritten in a recipe book, it actually is. Only the constructivist learning theory that states that learning happens from being actively engaged and by learning through experience, uh, students' experience or others' experience, that has been a very, very um, popular uh, learning theory in contemporary education. And I dare say that we do not learn only from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. Like there is an example of Sugata Mitra, so who is a computer scientist and a very progressive educational theorist. So he compares education as it is and as it should be with um, just in case versus just in time uh, analogy. So meaning that in schools we learn a lot of just in case we need it, and in real life we learn just in time when we actually need it. So. What's the answer then between uh, that gap when we in real life come across something that we need to know, but we didn't learn it in school just in case we need it. So maybe we were sick on that day or we were absent for another reason. What's then the answer if we need to know it now just in time? What do we do? Do we go back to school? Of course not. We don't go back to school. We collaborate with others. We ask questions. We find out or we learn it ourselves. Um, so Mitra's experiment actually brought about um, a disruptive concept. Uh, his, his claim is that if kids can teach themselves something, it's not worthwhile teaching them. So the question is, what's the future of massively centralized education machinery based on bureaucracy, hierarchy? Um, Definitely this pandemic has accelerated the thinking about it and it has emphasized the collaboration with others that's happening more and more. We ask our colleagues what's the answer. There's no shame in that. Um, but Luca, so how would you, in your experience with regards to collaboration in remote settings, uh, from your perspective of working and learning remotely and constantly learning new skills when it comes to digitalization, blockchain, video editing. Give us your perspective. Okay. Uh, I think three things, three things come to my mind. Uh, first one is communication, which includes also documentation. So I would say it's important to over communicate because if you're not next to each other, of course, there, you don't have the advantage of understanding everything you're saying. So it's better to repeat it more times uh, to uh, be clear, to make sure that the other person understands. That's why video calls are the closest we have right now to um, being with the person next to the person physically. So I would suggest you know, using video calls all the time um, and video messages. So first one, that's communication and includes it's, it includes documentation. So if you learn something, document it. If you want to share something that uh, someone should know in the future, document it, write it down, prepare it for the next person who will do the task uh, or, or in case you will need it. And uh, that's communication. So the second thing is transparency. And that also includes, uh, you know, communi communication and documentation should be transparent. Uh, because it will make your communication easier. People will have more trust, which is the third thing in each other. You're transparent. Um, you trust each other better. You communicate better. There is no hidden 
information and uh, it just makes your life easier and you know the umbrella of all of this is collaboration like uh, like you already know so communication transparency and trust it's all very connected tightly with collaboration what you've just listed is equals to me to leadership as i see it and and when we come to leadership i see a lot of controversy with the concept of classroom management versus classroom leadership like i wonder when the word management will be obsolete from education the same as it's getting obsolete in terms of businesses um, favoring leadership um, when it comes to leading people and not managing people and if classrooms are full of little people smaller or bigger, um, then why? I don't understand why we talk about classroom management. Paradoxically, we want more teacher leaders, uh, yet we praise them for good classroom management. Uh, management implies compliance and passive obedience, and leadership implies active engagement and contribution. And, and in, in those parameters, as, you, as you've just listed, especially in remote work and collaboration. So I look at the teacher's role more as a facilitator and as a coach who facilitate who facilitates thinking and this is this is practice that will affect our entire societies in creating cultures of thinking like we all remember that teacher who sparked a little something in our hearts and our minds that grew into a bigger something shaping us for who we are today um, it definitely brings its own ironies and challenges uh, but the, the kids the, the kids never forget it uh, Andreas, you've been um, you've been keeping up with educational topics for a long time, definitely longer than me. You're also very informed on the digital nomad aspect, and so from a historical perspective, what has changed in terms of education becoming more accessible through online learning environments, and what does that mean for families who maybe move a lot and who want to consider online homeschooling? Would you elaborate on that? Um, thank you. Let me just explain who I am. So my mother was a teacher. So my mother was uh, managing the kindergarten and then taught at primary schools. My father in the second part of his life was running yoga school. So he taught people. I personally um, felt that school is highly dysfunctional. So I considered that as a odd environment in which it was not really popular to ask questions. So I took the decision to leave school, formal education at age 15, and I love learning ever since. I consider the current schooling system as highly dysfunctional. It doesn't teach skills which are relevant. It doesn't teach anybody about his basic rights. Yeah, so which he needs to know for the rest of his life. It doesn't teach people how to manage their health, their emotional stability. It doesn't teach people how to actually develop a creative or career. It doesn't really teach uh, problem solving skills. And uh, the content stream of what is taught, and you quoted Zugata Mitra before, is all about just in case. The sad thing in which you didn't mention, that what Zugata actually highlighted as well, that less than 1% of the, of the skills which you learn in this just-in-case model is filling up a vessel with information out of less than 1% will be actually applicable for the rest of their life. So he came up with numbers which are, which are just mind-blowing. And so I was early on uh, connected to things like TED, what many people know as TED speeches. And um, I had the uh, pleasure of meeting the founder of TED, who is really passionate about education. So I, I found people on the planet in different parts of the world who were keen on understanding what are the alternative educational models. So, and luckily, we are now in a situation that information, existing information, which is mostly what we are looking into when we look into the current schooling curriculum models, is all based on the past looking backwards. So majority, or over 90% is looking backwards based on what we have known so far. And this is what the system systems are based on. So in, in today's perspective, we have that as a, at our fingertip. So that information is available anytime, anywhere for people who have mobile connectivity to existing knowledge, so existing know-how and do-how. Logically, what we experienced over the last 20 years is many things which we considered as facts have uh, changed and they keep changing. So in a, in a natural summary, 
all information which we want to have, uh, which we want to access is available for children at age four, five, six, seven, uh, at the base of the fingertip at any time. So, and yes, what Zugata did, he proved models where children are very motivated to learn. But why on earth should I be excited in the morning at eight o'clock to meet a teacher who tells me often very non-motivated people who are not inspiring and who tells me that I should sit in a concrete box at eight o'clock in the morning and get excited about a certain subject when I might be not even interested to sit still. So we, we are putting kiddos into a, into a model so far where we put them into a concrete box at a certain time and saying they should get excited about whatever the teacher comes up for, which is currently based on the existing curriculum for a certain age group. And so I think that's a very expired model. If you see how kids really get excited, look, look at a playground. You can see that they're highly passionate about subjects and they love to ask questions. And if you spend time with them, if you give them space, and what Dugata did with his uh, self-organized learning environments, he gave them questions and they found answers and they found answers which he didn't, or which we haven't thought about. So look into, into innovation. Many innovation workshops include kindergarten and primary school kids because they look into options and they are not based, they don't operate based on limitations. If we spend too much time, a few years, in conventional schooling, we are told what's right and what is wrong. And this often doesn't make any sense, because otherwise, many things which have been introduced in the last 20 years wouldn't exist. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. And as you said, with Sugata Mitra, I believe that every teacher also has that freedom to a certain capacity. Um, that even though the, uh, the nature of content and the measured benchmark benchmarks and curriculum and standards and all of that might be predetermined by state uh, factors or country national standards, there are still many ways in which teachers can achieve those same expectations that can vary wi widely. So there are different philosophies of teaching and learning that draw on several approaches, but um, uh, I believe that it's also on the professional judgment of the teacher and choosing a style that they feel comfortable with, that they believe in, that adheres naturally to their personality. Uh, in fact, there are more factors that drive how a teacher can unpack a curriculum. Um, I, con I consider the current system, Sonia, I consider the current system is highly centralized, highly bureaucratic, which works in hierarchy models, which operate by credentials. Yeah, and which operate in, in concrete boxes. And what we saw last year mm. in what I call the innovation pandemic, we saw the children who are not anymore limited to be forced into a certain structure, into physical buildings who actually do things at the time when they feel it is exciting or when they're excited about something. Excited kids are nearly unstoppable. And so <laughs> if, if they address the subjects when they want to learn them, they learn at light speed and they love to learn. Yeah, yeah right, right, right now, right now give me, let, let me give you two more things, Sonia. We are right now living a, a, pan, a, a pandemic of teenage mental health problems, teenage suicides. This is what we have at this stage. So, and maybe we should question if we have a curriculum right now which, which teaches them things which doesn't include basics, which are really relevant for life. We should, we should face the fact that we are right now having a system which is dysfunctional. Look, look at what women are complaining everywhere about equality. Yeah, is this where in the most countries you have the issue about equality. Okay, the most formative years of human beings, the most formative years, and different numbers exist, but let's say the first eight years, as one, some statistics and some research agrees, the first eight years are the most formative years. Guess what is the percentage of women educating children in the most formative years? Do you have a number? Is 98%. So, uh, 98%. So, we're complaining about equality. We are do not implementing it when we program the operating system of the next generation. And we are seeing right now that we have an outcome where they're either obese, mentally sick, or kill themselves. Hmm. Maybe it's time to realize that's dysfunctional. Right. Well, definitely, we. I think we all agree that it's dysfunctional, yeah, but, but, but it then, needs to but be then rewritten. Should, uh, so I think there's different role models because right now they operate. They want to be, they want to make money, and they want to compete. 
and that yeah. it doesn't it doesn't not the world the world in 2021 needs people who want to collaborate not compete <laughs> yeah who realize that operating in a circular manner is powerful as it includes being a great father and includes to give back to have something where you realize that it's all one so it and it's not about money and it's not about it's not about career it's about having a great life where what you are doing works in a circular perspective and the current model doesn't do that the current model creates people who want to compete they are suspicious if you do something which is good for everybody <laughs> where is the hidden agenda <laughs> yeah so this is what you often face in most societies and then the same women complain about equality but 98 percent actually are the educators and the role models of each new generation okay i just want to add one thing before because i i think we will go now for the questions also uh but one thing which i uh, if you don't mind uh to oppose to andreas in one part of it and that is that uh, the two, uh, 2021 uh, uh i don't know values uh, uh vastly uh, spread throughout the world is this competition uh, uh, then having the possibility of having money, 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 money. But I'm saying is that uh, maybe it is time to change things, but that in a way that to combine combine the three digital value with the new possibilities of digital era. Because if you erase everything that is pre digital, and you know, I'm not of that, those people that everybody should be now uh, free, greenfield, and uh, you know, very etherically go on Zoom. And I don't, they need uh, some kind of discipline, the kids. It's not the part that we have to make the old discipline with you know, beating them up, but some kind of order it has to exist. And, and sorry to believe I'm not in this etherical, maybe I'm old fashioned again, guy, even though I'm younger than you, but you know, this. Uh, uh, you know, mantra, Zoom, Om, Om, uh, schooling, for me, is not my kind of taste. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but... <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> it makes no, sense. No, nobody's saying we should abolish the older systems, Robert. Nobody's saying that. But the fact is that we do have many educators who are um, considering the context and what's happening and uh, they are faced with many many challenges and ironies because of the system that is obsolete as andrea said so educators will want to promote collaboration but the system will promote competition educators will want to promote assessment but the system will promote grading educators will promote cross-disciplinary learning but educators but system will promote subject-based delivery Educators will be aspiring for open spaces in schools with classrooms with no walls, but we will still be building them as nations, as states, as districts. As yeah, because only, but only because only because we don't know. So I think everybody people are not putting things into perspective. So we had a we had a schooling education model where we had multiple content streams until what they called in 1938, which was the German Reichstagsgesetz which was adapted in many, many parts in Europe, or which was applied in, across Europe at the, uh, to a certain degree, which creates this kind of mandatory uh, curriculums where, as an example for Nazi Germany, it was very important to make sure that they can tell everybody what's right and wrong. And we kept that going. So instead of allowing people to have multiple content streams, we try to centralize everybody, we try to centralize a content stream. And this reminds me of these old phones. But I disagree. Yeah, that, 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 uh, address. You compared now the Nazi way of education with the now the education which was left from the Nazism. But you know, there is it's, something which no, no, wait. But there is something which is called a social contract, and that is the social contract between everybody of us in the, in a social in one society where we agree on some common values which we accept. For example, it is mandatory that you know that the red light is the time to stop with your car or when you are going over as a, as a, as a pedestrian. Yes. You know, I don't believe in that kind of uh, very philosophical freedom that, oh no, I'm going to go with my car when it's green, when it's red, I'm going to feel it as it's green. You know, there are some, some things which are agreeable and has to be uh had to be br brought to the kids in the school that's not nazism correct okay thank what you I, what, I'm what i'm trying to say is that uh like what you have on your phone right now you have multiple apps and you have multiple content streams yeah so if you read newspapers english-speaking newspapers from different parts of the world 
they will report about things which happened in a very different way depending on where they come from and what their cultural perspective is. And what we see right now is that in today's world, it's very important to understand that content stream comes from different angles and can be differently looked at. So problem solving skills, which allow that to consider are not uh, actually taught at school. So this is a basic thing, Robert. And yes, you're right. It's very important to have the basics in place. But then again, for the basics, there's so many things missing. We're not teaching how to do basic contract negotiations, how to do financial transactions, how to, well, how to, read, how to read a loan agreement. People are often, challenged if you ask them what the effective interest rate is, yes. and they don't know. They don't read their loan agreements. Yeah, so, and this is just fundamentally wrong. They do not know about health management. They believe a pharmacy is a solution for health management. It's not. Yeah. So and so, there's so there are all ample things which we should urgently address because we have the status right now of a teenage pandemic. We have an entire generation which has mental health issues to a degree that two thirds identify with mental health problems. That is today's teenagers, and so that is an alert sign. And I believe that it's important to look at what's wrong and what are the options, and to be open, like to reset what is there, and to allow new flows and uh, Sana, you asked me before what happens with digital normats what happens in the remote working world people are using content stream from different parts and as an example in florida they introduced a virtual school over 20 years ago a state school and yes they have teachers from across the world they follow still the curriculum correct but more of a contemporary curriculum but they actually uh, created a model which allows you to to get access from across, not only from vertical. So you say this is the most, this is the right and wrong model because it comes from Croatia. And when you go across the border and, and have a different content stream because that's their content stream. No, that's that expired. Yeah. So you see what you do with R plus. You're reaching people across borders who are able to relate to the language or who are able to relate to the content. It's not any more territorial. It's an open border mm -hmm. concept and education works like this. This is why we are using right now a system which was not created in Croatia, while we are driving cars which are probably not from the neighborhood. So you have mm -hmm. an open border life, but you're still operating in a vertical content stream when it comes to curriculums that has to expire. Exactly. Those those different content systems can coexist. And there are examples of holistic, inclusive, cross-disciplinary educational models like the Nordic Baccalaureate that originated in Finland, like the International Baccalaureate that originally originated in Switzerland. But the problem with, with those educational systems as is that they often do not match the state requirements because the state requirements will foster competitiveness for university placements, for scholarships, for different tuitions, for enrollments to various schools. They are still in most of the countries in the world I know are based on the GPA, which is super contradictory, super contradictory with any educational philosophy. Uh, I know. So I, my, my, my first business partner was the first CEO of a German DAX 100 company who never finished his studies. It was a big issue in Germany and he doesn't have a PhD. Oops. Yeah, but you know what? He changed the entire company with 220,000 people because we learned so much by getting our first businesses off the ground, which is highly relevant. And so you see now that big companies like the Googles and the Teslas of the world, and even the Mercedes of the world and the Audis or Volkswagen, they're looking for people who can think what we call outside of the box. And why do they call it outside of the box? Oops, because during school, we kept them all in the box. So you, see, you are correctly saying that the limiting factor is the requirements from the state. But you know what? Who Real cares about the state? <laughs> yeah, WhatsApp <laughs> yeah, doesn't, I mean, I, care. Uh, WhatsApp okay, doesn't care about the state. Never mind. WhatsApp doesn't care about the state. Many things don't care about the state and they influence the entire planet at light speed. Yeah, so it's an expired scenario. The content stream should not be determined by the state. I believe the future will be, and where it will happen very fast that people don't want to go to college anymore. Yeah, but that, that, that's, not, not, that's not the answer what, what we want, is that we, we, we shouldn't abolish the institution which have been uh, built for centuries, an educational institution. We, we should, should uh, change them. them. No, no, but they, they like yes. anything else, they should update. And, uh, yeah, I agree with the update. Uh, the update. update. Yeah, but and, that's a reform, not abolishing. Yeah, that's, that's what we were talking, that's what I mentioned in the beginning about uh, 
just rewriting what school should be about understanding and not the recipes you can have the recipe but then you will have what we have now people who know all the dates and history all the wars and the war leaders and how many people died but have no understanding of why it happened or if that's interesting to them or what we have now in technology what it allows us is to track what people are interested in and uh, if you have um out of 10 points if you have one point in history but eight in maths then it's obvious that that person loves maths and something nothing is black or white and our schooling system institutional schooling system right now as i see it is black or white it's everybody is either black or white and if you love something more than you love something else nobody adjusts to you you have to do it in your free time and then the government and the institutions the system wants you to be better to to still you know be above average or above the average but you don't want it and then you waste your time and you wake up one one day when you can think if you can one day think independently and then you realize what you did <laughs> and <laughs> and like okay everybody lives their own life but if you if you look at the the whole thing as a society everything is made up by people like we are here now talking about something they realize okay we're going to do it this way and that's it but you don't have to and it's and the, no different if you don't and the fundamental issue robert i believe is that information is accessible i when i left school at 15 and i continued loving to learn i always made it my philosophy to know somebody who has the answer so i told people i don't have to know Oh, I have to know whom to call. So if I need an answer, I need a solution just in time. Yeah. I have to figure out who knows more than I do, and there's lots of people. And I have to have the right phone number, and I have to make sure the answer is the phone. It's even easier nowadays <laughs> because you can Google many pieces of information, and you can access solutions and inputs uh, in that manner. So we will never be able to compete with absorbing information, which is what most schools are based on. We need creativity and problem-solving skills. That's the core thing. We have to understand how to do emotional management because this is what computers cannot do. Yeah, The emotional management perspective of relationships, how to feel people, how to follow your intuition, how to actually connect and follow your gut feeling and put things together and allow uh, yourself to be connected to nature. This is the most powerful solution solution creating i think connection which we as human beings can have and so this is uh, where robots and computers cannot compete everything else absorbing regular information and producing it at light speed we will never be able to compete with machines what we have we have as human beings the given skill set to connect to nature as long as we allow it that is good for our health yeah, for our mental and our physical health and it is amazing to to model solutions for society based on nature and this is what computers and machines cannot do that's where we as humans are powerful and this is what the niche is which we and the skill set which we have to give to our kiddos and then we will not have teenagers who are obese and with mental health problems who want to kill themselves and imagine institutions exist only to teach children how to learn so the main goal is of the institution is to for children to learn how to learn and uh, to activate them to, to to learn what they like to learn about and then you have people who at any point of their life if they are interested in something they can learn it quickly because who cares about some statistic or something like you're learning about chemistry if you don't like it but if you do it at 45 you can just go online and learn it in 10% of the time. Like if we do this, school would be much shorter. You wouldn't have to go through eight years of school. Imagine you go through yeah. two years of school and you learn how to learn. You continue getting empowered to learn. No, I disagree and totally everything with you. else is about Sorry, I yourself with you. from the robot. I, I disagree with you. I mean, two years of school and then going away. You know, there is one thing which you are keeping forgetting, and I don't know, Sunny, if she wants to say something about it. There is the part of the, your life which is called adolescence. Uh, when you are uh, in creation, adolescentia, 
when you are in this age, this formative age, you need to have some kind of guidance. And I agree that this kind of guidance we had before should be reformed, should be having a new way of curriculum, new way of didactics and met methodics to teach uh, children. And I agree with Andreas that you have to be uh, aware of the fact that there are several possible uh, sources of knowledge, not only one as before, monolithically way of doing it, but to leave them alone after two years and uh, uh, believe that the grass will be bring beautiful uh, daisies, uh, I'm not... Uh, Robert, you know. Robert, what if you leave them alone from the start, so zero years? And the look only at, thing you, is you allow them how to learn. But, what, and one more thing, one more thing. If you, okay, you need some, let you say you need some uh, thradolysis, you need some leadership. What if you just let them, you create an environment where, um, where it's not called schooling. We don't even call it school. They're just an environment where they are, uh, you have a spectator that, that leads I'm them to learn. I'm for old fashioned. It looks like, you know, the Netflix serial, like uh, Tribe of Europe. And I like your uh, perspective of uh, utopia. But for me, this is not the way of living for our kids. I'm t t telling you as a parent, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, I, think I, that I believe Luca... it can be much shorter. And if you look at, at in a day, as a child is at school just to leave parents alone. And it's eight, eight hours there in school, listening to some boring professor, old guy who never did anything in his life and talking about something they don't enjoy. But let me, let me finish, let me finish. What if there was two hours, just two hours, instead of eight about listening of, about things that they don't give a thing about, and just two hours of listening or, or being you know, led to learn about something they like. Then you can say instead of eight years, you have two years. But calculate, in, in, in terms of calculating how many hours they spend in a day uh, in this physical facility closed, behind closed doors where you have to ask someone to go to pee and you want to say something and you're going crazy just to scream or do <laughs> something about it. You have, you have too much energy. I don't think the problem is the amount of hours, uh, not the quantity of those hours. The problem is the quality of those hours. Like the time can be structured differently as it is in many, uh, in many international schools. That's, that's not a case scenario for local schools, but it's, uh, I'm hoping that, that, that it's getting there. Uh, what I want to say is that th that person, look at who you called spectac spectacular, spectacular. Spectator, yeah. Is, spectator, yeah. Uh, so it's it's much harder to be that facilitator, the coach, the the supervisor in the classroom than than the traditional teacher, because it's not that you sit and watch kids and just worry that they don't kill them kill themselves among themselves, is that you need to be guiding them, facilitating their game or their learning or thinking. Yeah, you need harder. to be provoking. You need to be provoking them. All, you're on your toes all the time. Yeah. It's so much harder. So yeah. much harder. It's That's different. Why it should be I, don't, two hours I don't think it's harder. So you don't get I, too tired. And <laughs> I, do it, I do it with my children all the time, Sanya, and I don't agree that it's harder. It's different. Yeah. It's harder and than reading from a textbook. Yeah, but I find reading, reading from a textbook, I would fall probably asleep based on boredom. I think there's nothing more stimulating yeah, but you than know, coaching yeah. kiddos and making But listen, sure you... the world is not shaped by Andreas or by Robert or by uh, Luca sure. or by Sanya. Sure. We are different individuals and there is a, a, a need to have some kind of medial way about what sh which Sanya is talking. And this medial way where we will adapt our education to the new needs of the kids, that's one of the parts, and the fact of the new era, the digital era, and all the tools which were given. I think about that and what, what we can talk about because we, I'm not a professional, I'm not a, a professor in the school. Uh, and I can talk as a spectator, as a, a parent. And for this deeper dis discussion, we need maybe more people who are involved in the pedagogy in, in, the, in, the, in the educational part of in Croatia or regionally and see the experience. But what I'm saying at the end and is that we need to uh, reform schools, but not going in the way of uh, uh, shorting them uh, because of uh, art. What, uh, I'm sorry, Luca, what you're saying is, for me, is a lot of polarism. And that is, you know, let's shorten them and everything will be better. No, we have to seriously think about how to give their international excellent schools for not shortening the time of being in school. They're shortening the 
ways of being in the school. And maybe there are eight hours in the school, but very interesting way of school. Sorry, I, I was I'm not bit... saying it should be this way and nothing else. I'm saying hypothetically, most of these hours are being yeah. wasted right now, ba based on my experience. Of yeah, but let's not abolish them, but change them, Luca. Uh, not yeah. abolishing, change Luca, them. Change. Uh, change. Uh, I, you know, Robert, I don't agree that anybody should be for eight hours in any building because this is something which doesn't boost. But no, we are, you're talking about a building. You could, you could have a school which is eight years in the mask of Maximir Wood. That's perfect. There what I'm saying is that. that. So we are changing them. We are not abolishing them. We are talking about eight hours. It could be 12 hours a day, but different and a good uh, uh, shaped hours. I'm I, I just about said the way school it is now. It could be shorter. That's all I'm saying. Okay, but the, the question bottom we have, line. Uh, bottom okay. line, we have a questions which uh, I'm sorry for everything because we, we talked a lot and it was a great discussion. But let's say to even uh, Biocic, uh, he said uh, at the end, if we can say, what the uh, platform uh, do you see as must have platforms in, in education? <laughs> Who will start? Uh, I'm happy to explain my version of this. Yeah, so it should be focused on soft skills, creative skills, research skills, the ability to find information and to evaluate information to actually come up with solutions which are needed to solve issues and make the world a better place in each issue. And each issue of, of business, private life, if you want to separate them. And the model for that is all about just in time, not just in case. So you should teach them how to find that information when needed. We can, we, that, that's a call. And yes, it can be in groups, as Robert said, eight hours a time is irrelevant. The model should be motivating for children so that they are inspired and passionate about it because then they are unstoppable. And so, when yeah. you even ask about platforms, like there is no single solution. There is not a one platform that's a yeah, one size fits all platform. Sonia, there are, there are, there are multiple perfect. platforms. There are multiple platforms. Yeah, so you know what? Exactly. Re remember how we teach right now. We, we teach history mainly from a book or things. So you have VR glasses. You can you can you can do geography by actually walking on the, experiencing the, the North exactly. and South Pole. So yes, there are multiple platforms where we forget about books. Books are utterly boring exactly. for most people. Imagine most science with beings. VR glasses. Exactly. You know, I love yeah. learning about history, but you know what? Or when the, I remember my Latin classes at school, hallelujah. So um, <laughs> I would rather have VR glasses and experience the old Rome. And then you know what? Wow, and this is, by the way, the language. This is a different way to learn Latin. You know, so if you are passionate about it, and this is the context, so I can. And so, yes, we have different VR solutions. That's powerful, and we have access to that information. If you want to learn about India, take your VR glasses and experience Bombay. Hundred percent, exactly. So the bottom so. line is that we need to. The bottom line here is that we need to rethink the foundation of education and stop serving that fictive society that's obsolete even today, right? But do we have more questions, Robert? Uh, well, for now, I think we are uh, uh, coming to one o'clock and uh, uh, I think we should go finish it about, uh, and I do apologize for uh, being short enough, but if you go a little bit, but if I would just say that we should go on the final thoughts and that is, uh, let's start with Luca and then uh, Andreas, Sanya, who, was the leading will be the last is that okay yes uh, we have just one answer from uh Ivan Biocic. thanks andreas for Gerdes. so that is thank you Ivan. okay uh luca yeah um final thoughts i would say just uh focusing on teaching learning how to learn as soon as you can in your life can make a big difference and uh, if we just focus on that, I don't think there is one clear solution, uh, one you know platform, educational platform, or one way to do it. Uh, I just think if we just focus on the best way to teach other children or, or adults how to learn, it will uh, change their life. Okay, Andreas? The core thing is that we should keep, we have to keep the passion and the creativity alive. 
what you see from, from scientific research, NASA included, that kindergarten kidders have a creativity level and a problem solving skill set, which is 98%, 98% are tested on genius level, believe it or not. If you go right now through formal education, if you finish your PhD, you are 10%. So we kill them from 98% to 10%. Plus we have right now a disaster of a teenager generation. So it's, it's urgent and important to apply the learning from last year that they love to learn, number one, that they adapt, number two, that they have maybe like in your case, Robert, they have access to amazing Microsoft equipment. And it's urgent and important to reset up here. And at the time of artificial intelligence, accept the fact that knowledge is not core, but the application of knowledge is essential. Okay, Sanya. Thank you, Robert. Um, as finishing thoughts, uh, I'm going back to questions driven teaching and learning. Um, as I believe that questions, asking the right questions in the right time is the strategy that can spark curiosity and make magic and bring imagination to surface with kids. And that is what we need. Uh, while they are answering those questions, I um, I think that they should collaborate among themselves and be the protagonists in a classroom or whatever we have, if it's not a box. Um, and uh, the teacher is not the main protagonist. The teacher is the observer, the facilitator, the moderator, the model, the coach. And I would like to end there. Thank you so much. Well, for me, at last, I will just say that uh, I agree with the, most of the thoughts which you have said that uh, we have to adapt, we have to change, we have to talk, talk about those changes, how and in, in which way. And uh, I'm glad that we also, in some topics, we agree that we don't agree, but that's good that we have to uh, have the possibility of talking about it. And uh, it was a great pleasure to have uh, an, our monthly lit uh, session, and I schedule the same thing uh, for uh, next month uh, at the same time. The same speakers, different topic, uh, lively again uh, disagreeing, just to come to some common uh, uh, solutions which will be acceptable to everybody. Uh, thank you uh, to the viewers and those who will join us maybe in the post viewing. Uh, write us, uh, make a comment below, and we can try to share everything uh, on the next lead session. Thank you very much. I hope it was good for you. You liked it very much. Thank you. You're both welcome, our guest. Uh, you can come back to our, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, show next time again because we love you, because you like everything which we do. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.